I want to talk about the one legger guys. Uh, and I'm, uh, I know I, I, I texted Steve DeCosta this morning and said, Hey buddy, you mind sharing a little bit about what you do? Uh, Steve's been selling for, I believe a couple of years face to face, and he's been with us on our platform for at least a couple of months now. I've, I've listened to his calls. I hear what he does. So I, I would like to him to share about it. But Steve, before you come on, I, I just kind of want to give you guys a little bit of information, like my opinion on some of this, and maybe this isn't really a one legger, but to me, it is super important that the person you're speaking with, that you're on the phone with is actually the payer. Because if you're not speaking with the payer and someone else is the payer, you might as well be making a presentation to their cat or their dog. You might as well be. That's my opinion, guys. I put it out there. So, you know, I'm always, no matter what, I'm, I'm, I'm verifying. I want to make sure, like, if I have any reason, if I hear something, you know, for whatever reason, if the, the husband's not there or the wife isn't there, you know, in my opinion, what, what I'm doing is... I need to find out, whoa, 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 who is the money person? Are, are you, I'll even ask them, are you able to make your own financial decisions? You need to verify that sometimes because you're going to get people that have their daughter that takes care of all their bills for them. But a lot of times when it's like that, the daughter wants the insurance. That being said, Steve, okay, it looks like you've unmuted yourself. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, good morning, Doug. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Let's talk a little bit about the the old one legger. So right off the bat, when when you're speaking with a spouse and you know the other spouse isn't there, what do you do? Kind of how do you go from there? And, uh, yeah, that's definitely a, uh, a great question, Doug. And uh, before I even get there, I, I'd like to say first and foremost, especially for the new people, I uh, definitely follow the script that Doug's going to provide you. Um, I use the script literally every time, though I practically know it. And I make it sound like it's the very first time I've actually read it, including inflections and tones. And then we got to ask questions, surprise on some things, giggles, laughs, everything. I just make it sound like it's the, the very first time I've gone over. So you don't want to necessarily sound like you're reading the script, but you do want to use that script um, as a guide. Um, and so regarding one-leggers, um, as Brandon and I have discussed many times, I, f- I feel it's better to overcome the objection before it even occurs. And so uh, with that in mind, I've actually changed the order um, of the script. And I would recommend everyone change it to their own verbiage, how they feel comfortable, but still keeping the natural intent of the script. But I've changed the order and a few things on it. Uh, so fairly early on, I asked uh, the, you know, the lead, uh, who would be the one to take care of everything, you know, the beneficiary once you pass? And if they say their spouse, I say, well, that's perfect. And then I quickly add a follow-up question. I say, well, they'd be the only beneficiary. Most of them say, yeah, they'll be the only one. And then after that, I simply state, okay, well, uh, most married couples make their decisions together. Instead of you trying to repeat everything a little bit later, why don't you go grab whomever, go grab your spouse um, so that they can be part of this conversation. And uh, if they're home, then they will grab them. If they're not home or not available, uh, they'll, you know, they'll say so. And so then I'll follow that up with, well, in my home, my wife and I, we make all of our decisions together. Um, are you like that or, or do you make hundred percent of your decisions yourself? And, you know, depending on what they, how they answer that question will let me know whether I'm going to reschedule or move on. If they say they do make hundred percent of their decisions, to, um, they make the decisions for them and their spouse, then I'll say, well, that's actually perfect. But you have the driver's license number, the social security, as well as the banking available. And so um, I, I literally ask it that early in the conversation, uh, because like you said, uh, Doug, I, if it's not going anywhere, I want to end that one as quickly as possible, reschedule it and get on to the next thing. I, I'd rather find that out right now than 30 minutes later um, when they agree, they quote unquote agree to everything, but don't have their wife's social or their husband's social, or they don't have access to the checking account and all that stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Very good stuff. So yeah, th- exactly. To me, that's, that's, that's the way I look at it now. Guys, sometimes they're going to lie. <laughs> they may lie in the beginning by saying, yeah, I make all the decisions, or th- they may lie in the end. And, you know, and that usually happens when they say, no, I-, I take care of all the financial decisions. And at the end, they're like, well, I still got to talk to my wife about it first. <laughs> They'll do that. Um, I'm going to give you one tip. No matter what, I want to make sure I'm speaking with 
the actual bread winner. In this case, when you're potentially going to look at a, pitching a one legger, when because guys, I've gone to people's houses and seen where they're separated and they live together. Like you'll find weird situations like that. But the bottom line is, what I'm not going to do is pitch the spouse when they're telling when they're on social security or disability, and the other part part you know the the husband or the wife is actually at work. They're the breadwinner. They're the the money maker. They're the decision maker, no matter what. So that's that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, so anybody, uh, I know maybe Brandon, you do you have do you have anything? What you know? How, what's your perspective on the one legger and, and what you do in that case? Yeah. So you know, as you were just saying, whenever you have a one legger, first off, you want to not isolate. You want to bring them together. So try to bring them together on the call. Try to do it on that same call, if at all possible. If you have to, try to reschedule. Uh, but just remember, like I always say, we pretty much have one chance. So if you got them on the phone right there, you want to try to pursue some type of deal. You want to get some information out. You want to build some value during that one chance. Um, don't just immediately, okay, well, let's just talk about this whenever your wife's home, even though that's what we really want to do. Kind of warm them up to it. Don't drop them right away. Um, and then let's say they are saying that they early on, they're going to make all of the decision-making process. Usually that's going to be the husband um, is going to say that, but then at the very end, they're going to drop a, oh, well, I have to talk to my wife first, or I have to talk to my daughter first or my son. Uh, and we just have to remember that even though they say that they have to talk to the wife, talk to the daughter, talk to the son, talk to talk to the husband, whatever it may be, um, just remember that an objection isn't always what they're saying. Kind of read between the lines. You know, we are not our clients. We are not our clients. And that is the biggest thing that I try to remember every single time I'm talking to one of the clients is... I am not the person sitting on the other side. Whenever I say something like, hey, I need to think about it or I need to discuss this with my wife, guess what it means? I need to think about it. Give me like 24 hours so I can stew on this or I need to talk to my wife because I told my wife before this conversation started that I wasn't gonna make any decisions without her. So I'm gonna talk to my wife after, right? But we are not our clients. So a lot of times all it is is a blow off. They're just trying to put us off. It's an objection. And they're trying to say, oh, well, mm, uh, uh, uh. Uh, so what I'll do a lot of times is I'll go through, let's say they do it at the end. That is a different story than when they do it at the beginning. Okay. When they do it at the end, more often than not, that is one of the two main objections that we have. We have two main objections. The first one is credibility. Okay. Credibility and trust. Do they like us? Do they trust us? And then the second issue is pricing. So don't get caught up in a moment where you drop a quote and then all of a sudden this very confident man is not so confident and says, I need to speak with my wife. Read between the lines. Is he really saying, uh, I think that's a little too expensive, but I'm too embarrassed to tell you that it's too expensive and that I can't afford it. So be prepared to do a price drop. Be prepared to do a price drop if that happens at the end. Uh, very important. What they say is not always what they mean. Bingo. And we are not our clients. So, bingo. Exactly, guys. You know, we're, you know, we're not our clients. Most of them are, you know, retired, living on a fixed income. Um, in in most cases, barely getting by. So it usually anytime the one thing one of the first things I learned about selling insurance was whenever they make an objection, it's often like Brandon said, not the true objection. The true objection is either about the cost or it's about trust. That's why we do the looping. That's why we don't give up on these folks until we've addressed everything possible. Um, excellent, thanks guys. Did any, anybody else have anything to add to this? Yeah, I'll... Uh... I'll follow up on Brandon's. I agree with everything Brandon just said. I I, I do exactly um, kind of what he does when it comes to that. 
uh, most of the time it is a price situation. Or if they are sincere, I had a lady uh, this week, husband and wife, didn't know it was going to be a husband and wife. She set the appointment. And I went through everything with her, realizing she wanted coverage on both of them. And when we got to the end, of course, she threw it at me. Well, I need to need to really go over it with with my husband. Well, the deal was, I told her, I said, look, you know, you need this much coverage anyhow. And here's the deal. We'll set this one up to start, you know, the middle of November, give you a couple of weeks to think about it. Um, if your husband decides he wants a different amount, just let me know. We'll change it. But at least you know you have this much no matter what. She said, okay, I didn't. go ahead and do it. I, I make the decisions anyhow. So <laughs> uh, I, a lot of times I always throw that in there. Look, no pressure. We're, we're not going to set this up to start then. If, if your spouse wants a different amount or decides, hey, we didn't need insurance at all, no harm done. We got plenty of time to make changes. So that's, that's the way I approach that a lot of times. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. And thanks guys for, for, for jumping in on that. So um, there you go. You know, it's a lot of information. Some of you are new or going, wait a minute, you know, we, look guys, it's not that we're overthinking this. We just, it's important that you hear different versions, how we do the best way to do it. Um, those of you in your first week, a lot of your learning, what, you know, everything you've done to prepare to be on the phone for tomorrow Hopefully you've done everything you can do possibly, but what's going to happen is once you actually get on the phone, that's when the education really starts. That's when you really start to learn. There's nothing we can do to avoid that. It's, it is how it is, but that's why we recommend, you know, one of the things I recommend is to, that you just try to start with at least a thousand dollars. Even on the first week, starting at more like $800 isn't so bad because you're only going to be on the phone probably four days unless you work, you know, uh, Saturday also. But by the second week, I highly recommend all you guys that are that are starting this week be it actually your weekly ad budget should be at least a thousand dollars. This is going to give you a step up on the algorithms and the way they work. It's going to make things so much easier for you in the long run. You're going to be able to speak with enough people to actually stay busy and um, and you're going to make be able to, to do this in a way that won't be so stressful as if, you know, let's, for example, as it would be for someone who is only spending like seven or $800, for example. Um, so just a heads up. Um, I do want to just talk about a little bit about hard work and success. There's a couple of things that I want to bring up. Um, you know, when you're dialing, one of the things that I realize you've got to do things to keep yourself motivated, right? So, if you have to, like if it's really hard for you to sit in one place for several hours, maybe think of it this way. Break up your dialing sessions into like maybe um, maybe four sessions where you're doing like 25 dials per session. So that way you get a, you get a break every couple of hours. You do your 25 di dials. If, if you haven't made a presentation, you know, or, or two, then you made the dials at least. So by doing that, by breaking it up into sessions, I think it's, it may make it a little bit easier for you. That way you're not just thinking, well, you know, oh, I have to sit on the phone all day and just do that. You don't want to, you don't want to be negative. Remember, it's going to take hard work to have success no matter what. Um, another thing that may help, remember your why, you know, remember why you're doing this, whatever the reason, um, what was that book? The Secret. You know, I read The Secret years ago. You know, they, they even put out a movie on it and everything. But, you know, one of the things that I did pick up in The Secret is that visualizing helps. You know, when you're doing the work, when you're putting in the, the, the time, when you've got the system, whatever it is that you're selling or doing, you know, it's nice to have visualizations of what my why is, what my goals are. What is, what is this for? Is it for the kids? Is it for the wife and kids, the family? You know, is it because I just want that new home? You know, um, is it because I need to, you know, I need to, to, to get my wife off my back because I haven't been doing things the way I should be doing? You know, remember your why. Keep that. I, I think images of that are very, very good. Um, staying focused can be difficult, too, especially if you got family running around. You know, the kids get home at two. And so, look. It's important to remove your distractions, remind the family that you're working and this is your job and that 
you're not to be disturbed, really. You have to figure that out because I know you don't want to chase away the kids when they need daddy, they need daddy. They, when they need mommy, they need mommy. You got to be there. I get it. But it's also important that they know that you are here to work. You're not here home doing other things. Um, take care of yourself. You know, we just had the, the time change. It was pretty cool. Got in an extra hour of sleep. Eat healthy. Watch your diet. Sleep. Exercise. Do all this stuff. It's, it can only help you. It can only help you. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our clients and how we can earn their respect. And by doing that, close more sales that are really solid. Get better clients. Get more clients and better ones. Um, keep in mind, you know, one, one of the things uh, here, I'll give you like five tips. One of the things you got to make that first impression within the first four to five seconds. They need to sense immediately within five seconds. I am not exaggerating this. They need to internally sense that this is someone who is a professional at what they do. And this is somebody that I want to trust. You have to get that going. If you fumble and bumble, and we're all, we all do it when we're new a little bit, but if you fumble and bumble through your first maybe few minutes, it, it's, you're going to lose people. You know, I've heard calls where, you know, the agents just had such a hard time in the beginning. And, and, and maybe I was that way too, where they would literally get hung up on. The clients are hanging up on it. I remember I had a guy that was really, really, really as bad as it comes. Um, he came on, he gave it a shot a few months ago. And he just thought everybody was against him. He really did. When I spoke with him, he was just like, man, you know, it was just, it was, it was in his head. But then when I listened to his calls, he was just terrible. So that's why we want to be prepared. That's why we want to work. Nobody's perfect here. You don't need to be. Uh, work on your tonality. Have charisma. Have energy and enthusiasm. Very important. Sometimes they're going to give you the nonsense and you got to remind them about the why, you know, why they're speaking with you, what this is all about. Um, look at the objections as an opportunity to build rapport, to build now, you, oh, they're giving me an objection. Awesome. Now I'm going to be able to build up this product. Now this is why, whatever the objection is, it's that, that this is going the way it is. This is why this is the cost or whatever the issue is. Build up the product, build up the rapport, you know, do the loops. You, you should be prepared to do three loops per application. Basically, three objections. One, two. By the third one, you're going to be surprised. A lot of these people will go, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. I need to go ahead and do it. I'll talk to my daughter later. Bam, it's done. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Nobody needs to answer. This is all just something I want you to think about. How far are you willing to go before you give up on a client, on a potential sale? And you literally let them off the hook. So when you're brand new, I am telling you the mindset that you need to have, if this is your first week or even first month, especially, you really need to have the mindset of, the only way I'm letting them go and letting them off the hook is if I've made like three or four loops, they're just not getting in, they're arguing with me, one, two, they hung up on you, okay, nothing you can do there, or three, you closed the sale, but to me, it really should be they hung up on you or you closed the sale. But at the end, I've, I've got recordings. I know I shared a recording. Uh, we had John Peters talk uh, a few months back about a, a, a client that he and I were talking about. He was on the phone with this guy for almost two hours. The guy didn't trust him, didn't want to give him anything, fought him through the whole thing. At the end, he actually said, let me just FaceTime you. And, and they sat there and had a FaceTime conversation. And then the guy actually gave up the uh, whatever it was, the banking, the social and everything, and actually committed to the to the sale. And it, by spending all that time with this guy, he built up so much rapport that the client didn't even get approved as applied for. So he ended up having to pay more and the client took it. So that's why you don't want to give up on these people. You need to spend time with them. Um, once you've been doing this, once you're having a lot of success, you're going to have a better sense as to like the Spider-Man, the Spidey sense is going to kick in. You're going to have a better sense as to who you're going to be able to close and not, but that usually takes a long time. 
Um, I know for me, I had been selling life insurance products for years. When I got into final expense, I was selling at a super high level. So towards the end of my first year, maybe not, maybe halfway through my first year, it's this weird spider sense started kicking in. And I realized it was like, I knew, I knew if I had a buyer or not, I knew if I had a chance whatsoever. And if I felt I had the chance, I would hang in there and close the sale. 90% of the time I would at that point. So you kind of need to be doing the same thing, guys. Only you have a chance with all of them. If you can keep that in perspective, you're going to go far. You're going to get there quick too. They're going to test you. Now, this is important, talking about earning respect and building rapport. A lot of times they're going to give you a weird knee-jerk reaction or they're going to give you like, you're going to be two minutes into the presentation and, you know, where we talk about cost and et cetera. And then they're going to go, oh, no, no, no. I thought this was car insurance. That's when you got to remind them about the lead. You know what? A lot of car insurance companies are advertising on Facebook. But so you must have filled out one of those forms too. But no, I'm the guy who you contact. You saw my picture about the burial insurance so that your family doesn't get stuck with the funeral bill. You remember that? That's who I am. Bring it, remind them. Sometimes they just, just got to loosen it up. You know, they just, they just not like, you need to jar their memory sometimes. They're going to tell you it was free. I'm calling them out. <laughs> Look, Janet, you and I both know nothing is free, but the good news is if I can get you approved today, I'll be able to find you something that you can actually afford. That way, you know, the, I know you're concerned. You don't want to leave the family stuck with the bill. That way they actually have the money to take care of your, your funeral or uh, your cremation or whatever it is. So call them on it and address it. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll, I've, I've heard people say, oh, I, I thought this was health insurance. Same thing. Remind them of the lead form. At the end of the day, guys, this, these type of excuses, these early excuses, these early, oh, I thought it was something else nonsense. All they're doing, like Brandon said, is, is, trying, to, is trying to get rid of you. They're like, they, they get wishy-washy. Like part of them knows they need it. And then part of them is like, already having buyer's remorse because they know they have to spend money. Okay. That, that's just, that's the nature of the beast. When you're on a fixed income, that's how it really is. Don't listen to the nonsense, make them respect your time, but you got to, in order to do that, sometimes you got to call them out a little bit. You know, you got to let them know, Hey, no, you and I both know this is not free, but the good news is, and go and go for it that way. Um, a little bit about looping, overcoming objections. So uh, this is, of course, guys, this is very important. To me, when you get the objection, you want to loop back. It's an opportunity to build value in the product and to build rapport, right? I mentioned that a minute ago. Just have your notes ready so that you can do the two or three loops. And, you know, during the loop, without losing rapport, you do need to address the need for the insurance. So you're talking about the, the carrier, the product. You know, you're maybe addressing whatever the objection is. But you also need to remind them that need for the insurance. This is about making sure their kids don't get stuck with the bill. Um, one of the things you want to mention, you know, something that Chris talks about all the time, super important, and I hear it in all of his calls, is that you need to remind them, you know, it's in a way that's very chill, relax, comfortable, that we're not taking a payment today. We're, we're going to take care of that later. Don't We don't need to worry about that today. Right now, my goal is just to see if we can even get you approved. And always complete your loop with, can I make a suggestion? So that's the way I do it. Um, I mean, you can be direct. You can just reclose them and, and do whatever it is that's on the, you know, exactly what's on the presentation. You can literally redo the close two or three times. Um, but to me, I, I just, I want to do the, you know, to me, I just think it's, it's kind of important to like, I like to go and can I make a suggestion? All right. Give me a second. All right. Somebody unmuted themselves. Did you have a comment to make? JP. Jeez, man. I'm sorry. I unmuted by accident. My bad. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, I always talk about there's a difference between a salesperson and then the sales professional. 
for you to be successful, you either have to be the sales professional or be willing to do what it takes to become the sales professional. You know, to me, a salesperson is basically the same as a customer service representative. You know, meanwhile, a sales professional actually do enjoys doing the things that we do, like overcoming objections. And and they get that that buzz when they close the sale. That's that's to me the you know, the the sale high, whatever you want to call it. Um, A sales professional practices their profession and actually works to better themselves like on a regular basis, you know, listening to audio recordings. reading books, maybe even just going over training videos that you've already seen. That's what a sales professional do. You, you got to use, the pro uses the energy, the charisma, and if you're doing telesales, is really good at the vocal tonality. And also, one major important thing, to me, a sales professional never just takes no for an answer. You know, they keep going until the end results is acceptable. You know, they don't just let the prospect off the hook. At some point, you have to. But I am telling you, you should not be letting a prospect off the hook until you've made at least two or three loops, until you've overcome the objection and done everything you can at least two or three times. And, you know, one thing that a sales professional constantly does is they constantly work on bettering themselves and for, for those of you doing telesales, especially mastering the art of persuasion, influence, et cetera. <laughs> Guys, scaling, increasing your budget is very important for the law of large numbers to help you. That's why we recommend you starting in right around $1,000 and then scaling up. And so what it's going to do by you scaling over the first few weeks. So if your budget this week is $800. Next week, you want to jump up to my my opinion, you want to get it to a thousand. You're going to work a full five day week. And then the next week, 1100 and maybe the following 1200. You want to do that because it's going to help you get through the learning curve a lot faster. You're going to speak with enough people where you're going to make the fewer mistakes in the beginning. And then by your second and third week, you're not doing any of those mistakes. You've cleaned up that. You've already figured out exactly how to describe the signature process, and you know exactly what to do if, let's say, you're, you send the client, for example, a uh, you you do them a e signature, and they can't just they just can't do it. Now you're switching gears. Oh, no problem, Janet. You know what? We're just going to go ahead and do a voice signature. That way, you don't have to worry about the email thing. So be prepared. You have to scale to get there, guys. Um, Eight hundred dollars to get on your first week is fine because it's a four-day week. But by your second week, you really want to at least be at a thousand dollars. You really do. Whatever you do, be prepared to scale. That's how our system works. And also, let me give you a tip about the algorithms. We like to do it this way because every now and then we get a rare occasion where the first week a new agent is on the platform. We got everything set. You're running in your two or three states, and every now and then the, the algorithms actually do really well but it usually doesn't. The algorithms, they, they, they pick up in time. So by the second and third week, that's when the algorithm, that, that's when your cost per acquisition, your cost per lead goes down, your cost per appointment goes down. But it works with the two things, the time, sometimes it needs a couple of weeks, and the scaling, very, very important. Um, I know that one of you guys, uh, I, was, I was texting with an agent who had an, an issue with a client where, there was an insufficient funds and you know he had the draft date set up correctly and everything this guys this is going to happen i hate to say it sometimes these folks will accidentally give you the wrong account number so here let me let me just give you like a couple of tips um, to me one of the keys is to ask them for their account number twice okay so so they're giving you the account number i'm not going to read it back to them I'm asking them a second. Okay, can you give me that number one more time? Read those numbers from left to right, please. I want to hear them do it a second time. Also, ask them. Now, I just want to make sure, is this the, if they're on Social Security, most of them are, is this the exact count that your Social Security benefits go into? We want to make sure you have money there. That's why we want to ask. You do not want to take this out of their savings account when their Social Security money goes in their checking account. Because to them, what they just did is they told you, this is going to be something that's not important for me. So if I put the money into my savings account, then it'll be there. But I'm probably not going to do that because I'm not even willing to set it up on my checking account. 
you need to convince them it's got to be the exact count that their social security money goes into. Now, routing number, guys, you don't even have to ask them their routing number. If they've got it and they know it, great. If they're reading a voided check, okay, great. But it, and it's also the routing number, the account number, it's going to be, they're going to be able to see it on their smartphone. You know, if they've got whatever the account is, they're going to be able to click and see the routing number. Okay, so you kind of have to walk them through that. However, if worse comes to worse, you can ask them, you know what, I need to make sure I've got the right routing number for you. Uh, so your bank is Wells Fargo. What state did you open your bank account in? Now you can Google if they say, I don't know, California. Now you can Google Wells Fargo, California routing number. It's through, it's through the same state. Remember, the routing numbers don't change by counties. They change by states. So you need to know where they open the account because here's what will happen. You'll be speaking with somebody, I don't know, give you an example in Nebraska. And they open their, they used to live in California a few years ago, 10 years ago when they opened their account. So now they still have that account. So you want to verify what state did you actually open the account number because the routing number, if they open the account in Nebraska is going to be different than if they open the account in any other state. That's the bottom line, guys. So at least you can, you can Google that. Um, guys, that's basically it. Um, you know, I do want to leave you with a quote. And this is something that uh, Henry, uh, the classic Henry Ward Beecher quote, I think it kind of fits with what we've been talking about today. Success is not something to wait for. It's something to work for. I know you guys can all relate to that. We all know that. Now it's just a matter of doing. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything they want to add or any, anything, anything, guys, please raise your hand or just unmute yourself. No. All right. Good call. Oh, Jason, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, I've got one just kind of maybe for the newer people and maybe everybody does this, but I've been calling back all of my hangups. I don't know if, if everybody does that or not, because some of these and it, sometimes it seems like, you know, as soon as I say, oh, you know, basically indicate that there is a cost and click. And it seems like it's completely intentional, but I've had a few that, oh, thanks for calling back. I, I accidentally hung up on you, even though I. I would have bet a million dollars they hung up on me, but they don't. So then I just call them all back. And then if they do hang up on me, I leave them a voicemail like, oh, we must have got disconnected. You know, I kind of put it off on them like I'm shocked that they did that. Excellent. Excellent. That is that is that's there's your tip of the day, guys. That is solid, Jason. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Anything? All right. Good call. I hope everybody has a great week. Those of you that are in your first, second, third week, please reach out to me. If you can't, if for some reason I don't reply fast enough or, or I don't pick up the phone, you got Brandon. He, he's there for you too. We are both there for you. Anything you guys need, um, please just reach out. When you guys make your first presentations, please send me a text message. When you make a sale, please let me know. Everybody on this call should be doing that. Once again, hey guys, have an awesome week. Do your thing. Smile and dial. Happy hunting.